Um, in this case, the defendant was convicted after trial on counts one to eight, each of which alleged perverting the course of justice. She's also to be sentenced on count nine, a further count of perverting the course of justice, to which she entered a guilty plea on the 15th of February 2022, and for which she'll receive full credit. These sentencing remarks will necessarily be very lengthy. This is because I need clearly to set out the factual basis upon which I sentence, and because of hundreds of pages of evidence which have been served specifically for the sentencing hearing. I've also heard evidence during the course of the sentence hearing. This is not a case where it's necessary for me to obtain a pre-sentence report. This will inevitably be a lengthy prison sentence, and I have a great deal of information about this defendant's situation from her evidence in the case and the many psychiatric reports. By way of very broad summary, this defendant made serious allegations of a sexual nature against a large number of men between the October of 2017 and March 2020. In relation to each of the counts, there were a number of ways in which the jury could have convicted the defendant. Each count was divided into paragraphs A and B. Paragraph A in each count represented the making of false allegations. Paragraph B in each count represented the fabrication of evidence to support those, those allegations. In all counts, apart from counts six and nine, paragraph A was further particularized. The jury was directed that they should only convict if the Crown had proved so that they were all sure of at least one of paragraph A or one of its particulars or of paragraph B. Thus, it is important for me to identify in each count my findings as to what was proved to the criminal standard. At the time of the commission of count one, the defendant was 16 and 17. In relation to counts two to four, she was 18. In relation to the other counts, she was either 18 or 18 and 19. She's now 22, having turned 22 during the course of her trial. On count one, the defendant made an allegation against a young man whom I will refer to as C, who was hosting an informal get-together at his house. The defendant became drunk and smoked cannabis such that she was sick. C and others called for the defendant's sister and mother, and her mother picked her up. She then alleged to the hospital that she had been raped and made a police videotaped interview in which she asserted that C had kissed her, watched her urinate, commented on her pubic area, touched her bottom, sat on top of her, exposed her breasts and kissed them. He had, she said, threatened to set his dog on her and bury her in the garden or take her and put her in the sea. I am sure that this entire account is false and that she knew it was false. It was the Crown's case that she then created messages to herself which strengthened her allegation against C. Whilst I'm sure that these messages were not genuinely from C or from anyone present that night, I am not sure that these messages were fabricated by the defendant. It remains in my judgment a possibility that these messages were created by ill-intentioned third parties. It follows that in relation to count one, she will be sentenced on the basis that she is guilty under paragraph A, but not under paragraph B. As a result of this allegation, C was arrested and interviewed on the 27th of November 2017. He wasn't remanded into custody, but had the matter hanging over him until the March of 2018. The defendant had withdrawn her support for the prosecution in the January of 2018. In relation to counts two, three, and four, the defendant made three separate allegations of rape against one Jordan Trengove, who is content to be named in these remarks. She went on a night out on the 8th of March 2019 into the 9th of March 2019 with Mr Trengove and others. She drank or took drugs such that she became intoxicated and had to be taken home. Over the next few days, she began to hear others talking on social media about what had happened on that night out. I'm perfectly satisfied that there was no basis for her believing 
that she had been sexually assaulted that night. However, she chose to assert that she'd been taken to an address by Mr. Trengove, raped, and then taken back into Barrow in Furness. In order to support that allegation, she created a number of false messages of which she took screenshots, purporting to be from Mr. Trengove, in which he suppo made supposed admissions in the most derogatory terms. She sent those messages to herself and then took screenshots of them so that they could be handed to the police. She made the first of a number of errors in that one of the accounts she used to send these messages was created from her family home using the IP address of the Wi-Fi network there. After creating these messages, she then, on the 6th of May 2019, called the police from her flat, alleging that she'd been attacked that day. At first, she feigned reluctance to give an account, but eventually made a false allegation about the 8th and the 9th of March 2019 and the 6th of May 2019. In relation to the 6th of May, she alleged that Mr Trengove had come to her flat. She had let him in and he wouldn't leave. She said he tried, she tried to push him out and they started to fight. He had a lock knife with which he threatened her. She said that he stripped her naked in the living room and pulled her into the bathroom by her hair. She alleged that he then beat her with a shower head. She said that he raped her and didn't use a condom. At one point when they were on the floor, he threatened to kill her and said he would enjoy raping her. She said she had bruises to her legs. She was indeed injured, but this account was a complete fabrication. Mr Trengove was not even there. She knew it was false. She did indeed have injuries, but she'd caused them to herself to support her allegation. And as we will see, this was to become a feature of her conduct. Mr Trengove was then arrested and interviewed about both incidents and was at that time bailed. Then on the 18th of May 2019, she again called the police, claiming that Mr Trengove had again come to her flat and violently raped her. She alleged that she'd come home from a night out. Mr Trengove arrived at her house and came in through the door, which was not locked as she was expecting a friend. She tried to push him out and they fought. She said that he struck her on her face and her body. As she was on the floor, she alleged that he raped her. He wore a condom. The police, as she phoned the police who appeared to have found her um, uh, unconscious and naked on the floor. Again, she was injured. Again, these were self-inflicted. Again, this was a false allegation which she knew to be false. Again, Mr Trengove was never even there. This time, Mr Trengove was arrested, but not bailed. He remained in custody until the 1st of August 2019. He was told that matters would not be pursued on the 20th of August 2019. In relation to counts 2, 3 and 4, which concern Mr Trengove, I'm satisfied so that I am sure that the messages which she provided to the police, apparently from Mr Trengove, were created by the defendant in order to support her false allegations. It follows that in respect of these counts, she will be sentenced on the basis of both paragraphs A and B. I will now summarise the evidence on count five. On the 18th of June 2019, the defendant made allegation to Detective Inspector Nutter that she had been the victim of sex traffickers who had, since she was 12 or 13, sold her for sex at so-called sex parties. Her account mainly centred around a local businessman, Mohammed Ramzan, who is also content to be named in these remarks. She said that he had befriended her when she was 12 and shortly thereafter had sex with her and then done so regularly. She said that Mr Ramzan then persuaded her to have sex with another man. This turned into her being taken across the region to have sex with men. She described the abuse in some detail. She and other girls were abused. She claimed that the sexual acts would be filmed and those films sold. She spoke about individual acts of abuse. She spoke of punishment beatings, 
meted out to girls who didn't do as they were told. She said she'd been shown videos of a girl being anally and vaginally raped. She spoke of a girl nearly dying as a result of a beating. Another girl had been thrown down the stairs and then beaten. Another had had a dog set on her. That is the briefest of summaries. This was a detailed account of the most serious sort of sexual trafficking. This was, she said, first orchestrated by Mr Ramzan, but then others became involved. It had been going on, she said, for years. She provided lists of girls who had been trafficked. None of them had been trafficked. She supplied a long list of men who were traffickers. They were not. She said she'd been taken to Amsterdam by Mr Ramzan and forced to work in a brothel. She also said that on that same trip she'd been sold by Mr Ramzan for €25,000, but the buyer did not go through with the deal. She said that on another occasion an attempt had been made to take her to Pakistan, on another that she had been housed in a caravan for two weeks in the United Kingdom. There she had been subdued by being forcibly injected with heroin so that a procession of men could have sex with her for money. She said that there were constant parties at which she and other young females were forced to attend, often given detailed instructions as to what to wear. She was made to take a young girl for an illegal abortion. All of this was complete fabrication. She created an extensive cast of traffickers, many with detailed biographers. Some were invented altogether, others existed but were not traffickers at all. She also made allegations about being taken for sexual exploitation to Ibiza for two weeks, where men paid Mr Ramzan to have sex with her. This allegation <coughs> was also shown to be false. Indeed, in police interview, when confronted with the possibility of travel records being checked, she admitted that this account was false, only to seek to replace it with another lie subsequently at trial. Detective Inspector Nutter was understandably troubled by what she heard. She spent a good deal of time with the defendant, believing that she was the victim of serious exploitation and that there was a highly dangerous ring of traffickers operating in the Barrow and Furness area. She arranged a meeting of regional police forces to begin a major multi-force investigation. She offered the defendant a safe house or even participation in a witness protection scheme. The Crown were able to prove, and I am sure, that the allegations were a complete fiction. Certain parts were readily disprovable. She had been to Amsterdam, but with her sister and her sister's partner. To save money, they had all three shared a hotel room at night and were in each other's company all day. At trial, the defendant tried to claim that the attempt to sell her by Mr Ramzan happened on this trip, but her sister and her sister's partner gave evidence to the effect that she was never out of their sight. The females she named as co-victims of trafficking were spoken to. Many were profoundly upset by the suggestion. Some gave evidence at court, but many of the statements, denying they'd ever been trafficked, were agreed and read at trial. None of them had been trafficked. During the investigation, Mr Ramzan was arrested. he had never really met the defendant, had nothing whatsoever to do with trafficking, had never been alone in a room with her, let alone had sex with her. He described in court his utter consternation at being publicly arrested on the promenade in Walney Island and questioned by the police. I'll set out more of the impact of this offending upon him and his family later in these remarks. The defendant set about seeking to back up her allegations against Mr Ramzan and the fictitious traffickers. She did so in a number of ways. I will summarise here only some of them. She manipulated people with whom she was in contact via Snapchat to contact her. She would rename these people in her phone with the names of supposed traffickers. She would induce sexual messages from them and take a screenshot of those messages. Thus it would appear that she had a message with a sexual overtone from someone with the name of one of the supposed traffickers. When she was in the police station, 
She would elicit such messages to ensure that there was live evidence of the supposed traffickers pestering her. A number of these people came to court to give evidence. One young man from Essex had been rebadged by the defendant in her phone as Shaggy, the name of one of the supposed people traffickers from Barrow. He was, in fact, a young man from Essex who'd had little contact with the defendant. She'd told him she was from Portsmouth and cultivated a friendship with him to create messages she could later use. Another was a vague school acquaintance who wanted a relationship with her. He was renamed to Harem or Rami. She then took screenshots of these messages, falsely appearing to come from Harry, Harem or Rami, so that she could say they were evidence of her being trafficked. The defendant manipulated friends and work colleagues to involve them unwittingly in her deceptions. She invented people in her phone who simply didn't exist. She sometimes used two phones, one to send and one to receive messages from supposed traffickers or trafficked women. She would then take screenshots of those messages. There were other types of message she created. She would inflict uh, unpleasant injuries on herself which she later attributed to fictitious traffickers. She wrote letters to herself, supposedly from Rami. She made false diary entries. Based upon the evidence I have heard, I'm sure of all of the matters which I've set out above. It follows that in relation to count five, she is to be sentenced on the basis of all of the particulars under paragraph A uh, and paragraph B. I turn to count six. Whilst the defendant had refused to participate in a witness protection programme, she did agree to be temporarily housed by the police in a hotel close to Kendall Police Station. The police arranged for her to have a job there. These events happened during the time frame of count five. However, because the issue was completely different to the remainder of count five, it was reflected in a separate count. It's convenient to deal with it at this stage. On the 30th of June 2019, the defendant left the hotel provided by the police and travelled to Blackpool by train. She'd already booked herself a hotel room there. The undisputed evidence was that she checked into her room and spent most of her time there. When she did go out, she was alone and on foot. She was seen on video to make a note of her on her phone of the vehicle registration number of a car and the details of a takeaway restaurant. Having done so, she went to a shop, bought some food, sat in her hotel room and watched YouTube videos. The next day, she got up late and made her way to Preston. The police and her family were worried about her. She had ignored their messages. Eventually, police officers traced her to Preston and met her there. She was driven home to Barrow in Furness, and in the early hours of the morning, Detective Inspector Nutter came to meet her, worried as to what had happened. The defendant was later to tell the police in great detail that the, traffic, the traffickers had found her in Kendall and instructed her to go to Blackpool. There, she said, she was met by Mr Ramzan and threatened with a violent death. She was made to visit four premises, and at each she was brutally raped by multiple men. The car whose registration number she had noted down was, she said, used to transport her between properties. A flat above the takeaway, whose details she had noted down, was for the venue for one of these attacks. Officers took her to Blackpool twice to try and identify the locations of these places. This account was all completely false. Eventually, confronted by incontrovertible evidence, she was forced to accept that none of this was true. She was later to claim at trial that she was forced to give this false account by the traffickers, but I ruled that duress was not available to her. Indeed, I am sure that no one pressured her to go to Blackpool at all. She did so entirely of her own volition in order to make up false allegations against Mr Ramzan and others. I turn to count seven. On the 18th of July 2019, the defendant caught a train to Leeds. The clear evidence is that she spent a good part of the day in the park. 
she had two phones with her. She then travelled back to Preston, where she walked into the town centre. A young man walking home from a family party happened upon her. He asked her for a light, and they started to talk. They had a brief and entirely consensual sexual encounter. The defendant then caught the train to Barrow in Furness, exchanging details with the young man and tentatively agreeing to meet him at a later date. Once in Barrow in Furness, she walked to her flat. Her brother's girlfriend happened to see her as she walked her home, picked her up and took her home. Much of this, including much of what happened in Preston, was caught on closed-circuit television. By now, it was the early hours of the 19th of July. Once her brother learned from his girlfriend that the defendant was at home, he called the police. Everyone had been frantically worried about her all day, and she had been ignoring their messages. When the police arrived at her house, the defendant pretended to be semi-conscious. The jury and I saw body-worn footage captured by the officers. It's clear that the defendant was play-acting, pretending to be semi-conscious. She was injured, but the clear evidence was that she had inflicted the injuries upon herself. She then created a false account of what had happened in Leeds, Preston and Barrow that day. All of this account was inconsistent with CCTV, telephone and other evidence. She told the police that on Wednesday the 17th of July, a man called Salza, an invented trafficker, came to her door. He'd slapped her in the face, pinned her to the wall by the neck. He told her to follow orders she would get on Snapchat. He said that she had lost them money and she needed to earn them £10,000 as a result. She said that she was then told to go to Leeds. There she was taken to a house where she had sex with two men. She and a girl called Molly then walked to another premises. There were other girls there. There she said she had sex with three men. She was then driven to a chicken shop in Headingley where she had sex with another man. She sent, then said she was driven to Bramley and then to Bradford where she had sex with three men. She then saw her passport on the table with a ring on it and flight details to Bangladesh, so she ran. When the traffickers were able to contact her by phone, she was told to go to Preston. She said that the young man she had met in Preston was a trafficker and that he had sent her a message telling her that he had lined up some cocaine on a bench and she had no choice but to take it. She said that he took her to two Asian men who paid him to have sex with her. She then said that the young man himself then took her down a back alley and raped her. Eventually, she said, she was allowed to return to Barrow in Furness. Salza met her at the train station and he drove her home. We have seen the video footage of her walking home. She said that when she opened her door, he and another man forced their way in and she was forced to have sex with them both. Salza struck her in the face and told her to sort herself out and that they would be back for her at 2 a.m. Ten minutes later, the police arrived and she could not recall anything further until she woke in hospital. This was a complete fabrication. Much of it could be disproved from CCTV in Preston and Barrow in Furness. What happened in Leeds was shown to be false by the location of her phone. She had, during the course of the day, created other evidence to support the false account she knew she would give. Most notably, she had used one of the two phones she had with her that day to send messages from a person she described as Nicole to herself. She'd then taken screenshots of those messages. Nicole was supposed to be a fellow trafficked woman who was being raped at the parties. Nicole was supposedly angry at the defendant for leaving her and the other victims in Leeds. However, the agreed evidence was that when Nicole was apparently complaining about being left in Leeds by the defendant, the phone from which the messages were being sent was with the defendant on the train back to Preston. She was sending the Nicole messages from one phone in her possession to the other phone in her possession. I turn now to Count 8. In May 2020, the defendant was on bail 
for perverting the course of justice. It's clear that she was still intent on trying to invent evidence to support her previous accounts. In the earlier part of 2020, the instances of her apparently going missing and turning up intoxicated and injured had increased. On the 18th of May 2020, she set out from home on foot. It's clear from the evidence that she never left Warney Island and never entered a vehicle. At 22.49, she was found by police in fields close to her home. She had multiple injuries. One eye was swollen shut. She had a hammer injuries to her legs and abdomen, which were too numerous to count. Part of her little finger was partly severed. These injuries were all self-inflicted. Her account was that she had intended to catch a bus to travel to Barrow, but one of the males associated with those who'd exploited her offered her a lift, which she accepted. She then said that she was taken to a house in Barrow in Furness. There were ten males there. She said that a number of named men raped her at that property. One of them assaulted her and tried to cut her finger off. One of them drove her back to Warney Island. She walked off to where the police found her. A few days later, <coughs> the police found a hammer, which she had purchased some days before. It was hidden against a fence close to where the police had found her. It bore traces of her blood and DNA. A home office, a home office pathologist gave evidence to the effect that the serious injuries she had sustained were completely inconsistent with her account and completely consistent with being self-inflicted with the hammer which she had bought, which was found close to her and which bore her DNA. On the 20th of May 2019, the defendant made a Facebook post in which she posted shocking photographs of the injuries she had fl inflicted upon herself. These photographs were very ga graphic and bound to produce a significant response. In that post, she referred to these having been inflicted by three, as she put it, Asian men, as they took her to various sex parties. In that same post, she referred to having been similarly abused by Asian men and men of Pakistani origin in various locations across the north of England for a number of years. She said that she would continue to tell the police everything she knew she encouraged parents to be vigilant and children to speak out if they were concerned. She did not mention that she was already on bail for perverting the course of justice. I turn to count nine to which the defendant pleaded guilty. This admission represents her writing a letter from custody to her sister, asking her sister to tell her, that is the defendant's solicitors, that a hammer had been found in her bedroom. This was an attempt to create a false defence to count eight. When she entered her plea, it was on the basis only of what she wrote to her sister and not what was said to her mother. In the context of this case, it is not necessary to decide that issue and I will sentence her on her basis. The defendant is 22. She had no convictions prior to these matters coming before the court. I note that she was under 18 at the time of the commission of count one. She had turned 18 by the time uh, all other offences were committed, but I bear in mind her young age and the principles set out in the guideline in relation to sentencing children and young people. Though she was an adult at the time of the commission of the vast majority of this offending, I must bear in mind her maturity as well as her chronological age. There is evidence that she is immature. Apart from her age, there is some other personal mitigation. There are clear overtones of difficulties in her childhood. Uh, she's been self-harming from a young age. However, there is little clarity about what these difficulties involved. It is mitigation that before this offending, she was of good character. It is troubling to say the least that she shows no significant sign of remorse, even continuing to profess the truth of her allegations. The only flicker of appreciation of what she has done came today with a brief note read by her counsel regretting the effects of her post on the 20th of May 2020. I've received much psychiatric evidence in this case, all of which I've read. 
I heard evidence yesterday from Dr Bacon called on behalf of the defendant. Dr Bacon maintains that the defendant has a complex post-traumatic stress disorder. Dr Locke, who has provided a report for the Crown, does not accept that this is a condition, uh, conclusion which can be drawn, given that there is no satisfactory account of any antecedent trauma. I agree with the conclusion of Dr Locke that there is no evidence upon which I could conclude that there is a complex post-traumatic stress disorder. Since she has been found guilty, the defendant has hinted at other sources of trauma, but has given no real indication as to what it could be. Of course I've considered whether the aberrant nature of these offences means that I should assume that the defendant is suffering from some mental impairment. There is no explanation for why the defendant would commit these offences. She has gone to extraordinary lengths to create false accusations, including causing herself significant injury. No explanation for this behaviour is apparent. However, that does not mean that I should speculate. Unless and until the defendant chooses to say why she has told these lies, we will not know. In any event, I question the relevance of the defendant suffering from a complex post-traumatic stress disorder in relation to sentence. When Dr Bacon gave evidence yesterday, I asked her to comment on whether such a condition could reduce the culpability of a person to be sentenced for perverting the course of justice. Dr Bacon had told us that this was not within the scope of her instruction from the defence. When I asked the question of Dr Bacon, Ms Blackwell, KC, intervened, telling me it was not the defence case that the defendant's complex post-traumatic distress disorder, if that is what she has, is relevant to culpability. I do accept that it is part of her personal mitigation that she has vulnerabilities that I will take into account. I turn to the structure of the sentence. The count which concerns C and the counts which concern Mr Trengove are separate from each other and from the other offending in this case. However, the offending at counts 5, 6 and 7 can properly be regarded as a course of conduct. Counts 8 and 9 are together part of the same course of conduct and whilst they could be seen as part of that represented by counts 5, 6 and 7, they concern a separate incident and were committed on bail for other matters. I intend to impose concurrent sentences on counts 5, 6 and 7. However, there will be cons a consecutive sentence on count 1. There will be additional sentences on counts 2, 3 and 4, concurrent with each other, but consecutive with the other sentences. There will be further sentences on counts 8 and 9, concurrent with each other, but consecutive to the other sentences, save that I will temper the structure of these sentences to give effect to totality. There is no guideline for this offence, and I apply the general guidelines overarching principles. The maximum sentence is at large. I've been provided with a number of authorities, which I've read, there are no analogous offences for which there are guidelines. I consider first the defendant's culpability, then the harm. I consider the purposes of sentences, sentencing, and then the aggravating and mitigating features. I must then consider totality before arriving at my final sentence. The cases to which I've been referred provide the following factors, which are amongst those that I should bear in mind. I remind myself that because this offence strikes at the heart of the administration of justice, it is to be regarded as serious. Deterrence is an important aim of sentencing, though I must remember that when sentencing young people, this may be extinguished or diminished where the principal aim of the youth justice system is to prevent offending by young people, and I must have regard to the welfare of the defendant. This offence is fact-specific, Previous cases are of little assistance. When considering culpability, I must take account of the seriousness of the underlying offence. I bear in mind the nature of the deceptive conduct and the time over which it continued. I consider whether the offence casts suspicion on others, whether others were arrested. In this case, I am asked to consider community impact. I'll set out in detail my approach in this regard. In relation to all counts, I bear in mind that these were allegations of sexual offences. These carry not only the risk of prosecution, but also a potentially indelible stain 
on the character and reputation of everyone in accused. Sexual allegations, even where disproved, often leave the falsely accused person living under a general and misplaced suspicion. I consider culpability and harm. In count one, the culpability is high. The allegation was very serious. However, the defendant withdrew her support for the prosecution of C after two months. The harm is also high. In his victim personal statement, C sets out how frightening it was to be wrongly accused and then arrested and kept in the police station. He had to remove himself from social media because he was wrongly accused of being a rapist. Even five years later, he says he doesn't go to Barrow Town Centre because he fears he's under suspicion. He couldn't even bring himself to pick up his son from nursery for fear of what people were saying. He describes the defendant's false allegations against him as the worst experience of his life. He does not think he will ever recover. In relation to counts two to four, the culpability is higher still. The allegations were even more serious, and there were a number of them. They were maintained over a longer period. They were bolstered by the creation of false evidence with some degree of sophistication. The harm is also even higher than in count one. Mr. Trengove's house was spray-painted with the word rapist. His mother had to leave her house. He was remanded into custody between May and August 2019. Even when released on bail conditions, he had to live far from home for a further 19 days. When he returned to Barrow, he was abused on the street by strangers. He became isolated. He tried to take his life in August 2020 and is still taking antidepressant medication. He lost any sense of self-confidence. He says he can no longer work. He has a child now and social services re received scores of anonymous phone calls <clears throat> saying he is a rapist and not safe to be with his child. He recently moved house and a neighbour called him a rapist saying they didn't want him living there. The culpability in relation to counts five, six and seven could hardly be higher. The allegations made were of the utmost severity. They were made over a protracted period. There was considerable sophistication in the creation of false evidence to support them. The harm in relation to these counts is extremely high. Mr Ramzan was arrested on the 7th of July 2019 in the public street in the community where he lives and then held in custody for 36 hours. Two weeks after his arrest, he was in such despair that he tried to kill himself in front of his family in the most graphic and upsetting way. He sustained injury in that attempt, which has left scars. Though he was informed the next month that there will be no further action by the police, that was, as he puts it in his statement, only the start of the worst period of his life. He then describes being targeted by sections of the Barrow community. He's been unable to sleep and to this day fears for his safety. The windows of his vehicles have been smashed and their tyres damaged. He and his family have had to endure abuse. The windows of his rental property have been put in and then once repaired, immediately put in again. He's received countless death threats over social media. He's felt anxious going out for the last three years. His family, including his children, have been affected. For a period, they had to move out of the family home. He describes the trauma of being cross-examined in court during the trial. His business, businesses were ruined. He describes going from a successful businessman to someone who has virtually nothing. Also with, in consideration of harm is the young man who happened to meet the defendant in Preston on the 18th of July 2019 on the way back from Leeds. When he was told that he'd been accused of raping the defendant, he suffered serious consequences. He tells me in his statement that he was studying for professional exams and doing well at work. As a result of this allegation, he was unable to continue his studies and hasn't worked since. He tells me he suffered a serious crisis in his mental health. He attempted to kill himself. Though the tone of his statement suggests that this false allegation was not the only cause of these problems, it is his belief 
that they significantly contributed to them. He remained anxious about going out and meeting people. He doesn't trust people. He found the trial itself very stressful. Since then, he has started to feel better. I turn to the statements of those who were wrongly identified as being the victims of exploitation. Their names may not be reported. They all refer to the surprise of being approached by the police about matters of which they knew nothing. One then refers to particular problems she had as she was pregnant at the time she was spoken to and particular problems which followed. Another speaks of her feelings at having been, as she puts it, exploited by this defendant. Another speaks of the disruption of being required to give evidence at court at a particularly inconvenient time in her life. I now turn to the question of community impact. Under Section 63 of the Sentencing Act 2020, I must consider the harm which the defendant intended and that which might reasonably, might foreseeably have been caused. I've seen statements in relation to this topic and viewed a compilation of footage taken at the time. According to the statement of Superintendent Pearman, the period following the Facebook post on the 20th of May 2020 was turbulent in Barrow. He says that Barrow had not seen such a public display of anger for 30 years. There were public demonstrations targeting the local paper, the local Asian community and the police. This was in the height of the first lockdown and Superintendent Perman tells me in his statement that there was a sense of heightened tension for about four months. The comments attracted by the defendant's post named local businesses who feared they'd be subject to attack. One restaurant had its windows smashed. Police resources were diverted to dealing with the threat. Death threats were made against local restaurant owners. Marches were organised to protest about a suspected police cover-up. The fire service installed smoke alarms at vulnerable premises. Local journalists were the subject of credible threats. One left her home and moved out of the area. Racist anti-police graffiti was sprayed on a wall in Barrow. Threats were made on social media against the police. A demonstration convoy of cars drove from Barrow to Ulverston and back again on the 25th of May. The police were under pressure from those who believed they were complicit in a cover-up on the one hand and those who felt unsafe at the hands of apparent vigilantes on the other. Individual police officers on patrol seeking to support the community in COVID were subject to insults. Social services were also the subject of unwarranted insults and criticism. The local newspaper was subject to boycotts and ultimately, I'm told, collapsed for, for financial reasons, though there's no evidence before me upon which I could conclude that this was a de direct result of the boycott. By mid-June, there were ongoing protests. These appear to have been in response to a person from out outside Barrow who was active in the demonstrations having been arrested. The, the issue then appeared to be more his arrest. Nonetheless, there were serious consequences and Indian restaurants' windows were smashed. There were further protests and further allegations of a police cover-up. In the meantime, there were credible threats to police officers. Attempts were made to find their home addresses. Online threats were made that they would be found and they would be harmed. I'm told that this state of arrest continued until the August of 2019. Local people felt motivated to, don to donate their money to a fund which was set up to support this defendant. This fund quickly reached £22,000. What effect, if any, should this have on the sentence of the defendant? During the course of this trial, I've heard many days of evidence from this defendant and have read hundreds of her social media communications. It is not the Crown's case that when she blamed Asian and Pakistani men for her abuse, she was racially motivated. I agree with that position and will sentence on the basis that she was not so motivated. I note that in this case she has made false allegations about white men also. I'm sure she chose to lie about Asian men because she was modelling her lies on other cases of national prominence. She regarded the prospects of being believed 
as greater if she based them on true cases already within the public consciousness. She was not principally motivated by a desire to stir up public unrest. However, I cannot conclude that she chose to make her Facebook post of the 20th of May 2020 for any other reason than that she intended to create an impact within the town. I accept that there was no direct incitement to do anything, but it was entirely foreseeable that there will be considerable community impact upon those of Asian or Pakistani heritage. She cannot be held wholly or directly responsible for the criminal behaviour of others who used her allegations as an excuse for their own inexcusable conduct, but it was foreseeable that others would behave in antisocial and unacceptable ways. It was not foreseeable that her cause would be taken up by those outside Barrow and developed to the extent that it did. However, some community impact was foreseeable. To that limited extent, I take into account the community impact. The harm of this offending extends to an undermining of public confidence in the criminal justice system. We are aware that sex trafficking of young females does occur. There is a risk that genuine victims will, as a result of this defendant's actions, feel deterred from reporting it. People may be less likely to believe their allegations. I'm sure that those charged with investigating such offences will do all in their power to avoid any reluctance to investigate such allegations. In this case, I make reduction for the defendant's age, then for personal mitigation. In relation to count nine only, I reduce the sentence for credit for a guilty plea. I then further adjust the sentences for totality. To assist in understanding how I have arrived at my overall sentence, I first set out the sentences after, after trial for each count without applying any reduction for any of these factors. In relation to count one, the sentence would have been two years imprisonment. For counts two, three and four, five years imprisonment, concurrent with each other, but consecutive to the sentence on count one. For counts five, six and seven, seven and a half years imprisonment, concurrent with each other, but consecutive to the sentences already imposed. For count eight, two years imprisonment, and for count nine, one year and four months imprisonment, both consecutive to the sentences already imposed. I then turn to the various reductions for the factors mentioned above. The defendant was a child when she committed the offence at count one. The relevant guideline indicates that the, the court should take as its starting point the sentence likely to have been imposed on the date at which the offence was committed. That sentence would have been, if custodial, a de detention and training order of less than two years the reduction from the adult sentence will be one half for count one. In relation to the other counts, the reduction for age will be of the order of one quarter. Uh, those, beg your pardon, there will be a reduction for age of one third from the adult sentence in relation to counts two to four. In relation to the other counts, the reduction for age will be of the order of one quarter. She was 19 during much of this offending. After her false allegations about Mr. Trengove, this was not impulsive offending arising from naivety. That explains the lesser reduction. I then reduce the sentences further to take account of her personal mitigation. I then reduce the sentence on count nine to reflect her credit. Finally, I take account of totality. I do this by making the sentences on counts eight and nine concurrent with each other and other sentences and by further reducing the sentences on counts five to seven. Ellen, Ellen Williams, please stand up. These are the sentences that you will serve. On count one, there will be a sentence of six months imprisonment. On counts three to five, the sentence will be three years imprisonment, concurrent on each count, but consecutive to the sentence on count one, giving a total so far of three and a half years. There will be sentences of five years on counts five, six, and seven, concurrent with one another, but consecutive to the sentences already imposed. Finally, there will be a sentence of one year and three months imprisonment on count eight, and six months imprisonment on count nine. Those sentences to run concurrently with each other and the other sentences imposed. That gives a total sentence of eight and a half years imprisonment. 
you will serve half of the total sentence of imprisonment in custody, after which you will be released on licence. The days spent in custody will count towards your sentence. You have spent 361 days on a qualifying curfew. Because of that, the time you must spend in custody is reduced by 179 days. If that figure is incorrect, it can be corrected later without a further hearing. On release, your licence will be subject to conditions. If you breach the terms of your licence, you'll be liable to be recalled to serve the remainder of the sentence. There is an application for a serious crime prevention order. I find that this is a serious offence for the purposes of this application. There are reasonable grounds for believing that the order will protect the public. I exercise my discretion in favour of making the order as sought with amendments to the effect that she may also possess a tablet and games console and that you may also uh, be able to operate a work and a personal email. That order will run for a period of five years from the 17th of February 2025. I order deprivation and destruction of the items on page one of divider eight of the Crown's bundle of documents. If the statutory surcharge applies, the order can be drawn up in the appropriate amount. Thank you. Sit down, please.